Great. So, um, shameless plug, uh, go out and buy this book. Um, it's well reviewed, uh, number one selling book in MIT press last year, which, um, was probably a low bar, but we, we tripped over it. Um, and it's about electrification and what you would actually need to do to the U S economy to meet a climate target of one and a half to two degrees and sort of what, what, how extreme that level of effort needs to be. Uh, that effort is obviously related to rewiring America, a nonprofit I started last, actually in 2020, two years ago now, with Alex Lasky, former CEO of Opower, um, which is a, an energy efficiency company early in that space. And largely for the last year, rewiring America has been working on uh, the ill-fated Build Back Better policy and a lot of the climate components of that. And a lot of this talk, in fact, was presented to um, a uh, all of the U.S. senators in an in an effort to help get built back better over the line and and its climate impacts. So it's going to be about electrification, which is really about our carbon crisis, which is at, at fundamentally an energy crisis. Um, Eighty-seven percent of emissions in the U.S. are from energy. That's from using our coal, natural gas, and our oil. The remaining 13 are emissions from agriculture, mostly from methane from uh, cattle and, and sheep. Some from refrigerants. So that's uh, basically refrigerant leaks from HVAC systems and actual refrigerators. Uh, and then soil management and nitrous oxide emissions. They're the three major emissions that are not energy. But today we're gonna basically focus on the big slice of the pie, the energy emissions. Uh, energy emissions were first mapped in the US. So the history of what we know about our energy problem relates back to the energy crisis of 1973 that landed on Nixon's desk. Um, the US was cut off to 15% of its energy supply by virtue of the Arab oil embargo. There was not a Department of Energy at that point. There was no Energy Information Administration. And Nixon actually turned to a group called the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. That was the best scientists at the time who were thinking about energy. And in, because it was 1973, they were thinking about how much nuclear they could put on the grid. That was as close as we had to a DOE. They scrambled to do a research project on the economy and drew a picture like this. This, this is called a Sankey diagram, which tracks the flows of primary energy on the left. So that's nuclear at the top, natural gas, coal, and oil. Uh, and then how it flows into various sectors. And they defined at that time, or divided the American economy into the electricity sector, the residential, the industrial, the commercial, and the transportation sector. Uh, and we've really, that is the framework that we still use more than 50 years later, or actually almost exactly 50 years later, I guess, um, when we talk about large scale energy flows in the US economy. Um, that was the, the 1976 flow diagram for the US. This is the 2020. Oddly, um, the ratio of useful to wasted energy didn't change enormously. Uh, the quantity of energy more than doubled. Um, and we added a few more sources on the supply side over there on the left. But it doesn't look uh, uh, hugely different than it did um, in the 70s. The main lesson coming out of the 70s was waste is bad efficiency is good um, for lack of other options the solution to the supply side crisis was to make you know if you're missing 15 percent of your energy on the supply side make everything 15 percent more efficiency on the demand side that gave us efficiency as policy um cafe this is the origin of the cafe fuel standards trying to make cars more efficient so lower our need and Energy Star appliances. So if we used less gas in our furnaces, less oil in our cars, that was that was the solution for that and has largely defined um, the demand side energy policy for 50 years since. Climate crisis is a different kind of crisis to that original oil crisis. And I think we need to think about it in a new way because we can't efficiency our way to zero emissions. So we need to think beyond just traditional efficiency programs to transformation. Um, this is just to say, yeah, we're still stuck here, but we need to think like this. So this data, I'm going to quiz you on every line in this graph at the end. So read it carefully. Um, this is what happens. I got funded in partnership with the DOE to 
to study all flows of energy in, in the highest resolution you can through the US economy. So this was about, uh, we could register about 0.1% energy flows. So I can tell you things like 0.6% of US energy flow is children driving school in buses. 0.2% is the energy used in slaughterhouses in the US. Nearly 1% of US energy flow is using natural gas to pump natural gas through uh, 2.3 million miles of pipelines. Um, this gives you an extraordinary amount of detail. I've color coded it according to sector. <clears throat> Um, these slides will be available later if you want to actually dig into this. It is kind of fascinating. The industrial sector is this blue sector at the bottom, and you can see quite a huge amount of detail there uh, at the end in terms of where energy flows are um, as, as we are able to measure or estimate them in the US economy. That work really was the basis and the starting point for the book, Electrify. Um, and these are some of the you know, this is a summary of the large scale flows. Again, you can see in industrial is a quarter of the 100 quads of energy flow in the US. You can see that at the bottom. And I ha have a look at each sector. Um, the US government itself measures its flows. So it's a sector unto itself. The interesting thing, it uses about 1% of US energy flow, 1.3 quads. Um, nearly half of that is jet fuel. So the DOD is very much dominated by its jet fuel. Uh, the second largest is diesel. Um, you can see the next largest government sector after the DOD is the Postal Service. Obviously, that's in its uh, fleet of vehicles. This is the residential sector. Uh, I'll skip over that because I'm about to go into that in much more detail. Commercial sector, again, you can look at these slides later. They're here for your reference. Uh, transportation sector, it is very much dominated at the bottom by uh, highway uses, 21. Um, of 27.5 quads. I'm not sure why the number at the top there is 46.4. I've got to fix that. Non-highway uses are water and air travel and rail. Um, and anyway, the highway dominates of those 21 highway, five and a half quads are freight trucks um, and the rest is light duty vehicles, air cars and light trucks. Uh, you can actually break that down. Curiously, a lot of industrial energy use as you would think about it, is categorized under transportation. You can see here, you know, 0.2 quads or 0.2% uh, of US energy flow is the energy cost of trucking pulp, newsprint, paper, and paperboard, or meat, poultry, fish, and seafood. So you can actually, a lot of what you would come under your, your jurisdiction as a business operator is not only the industrial energy use, but the transportation energy uses. A lot of the sectors are coupled, and this also speaks to we need to think beyond traditional sector breakdowns if we're really going to comprehensively address uh, climate change. This is the industrial sector. Um, it is quite a lot of detail again here. This is here for your reference. I'm going to go into this chart in a lot of detail at the end of the conversation. Um, but I think what you, what I'm hoping you understand is now when I, I build these diagrams, I actually read 50,000 odd pages of footnotes to find all of those energy flows. And really, I now see all of the machines underneath the US economy from the giant supply side machines, um, such as coal trucks and coal loaders, all the way to demand side machines, such as um, dishwashers and laundry dryers. I think it's that machine level view that lets you start to think about the electric transformation in an insufficient detail to be able to um, plan what to do. So historically, you know, on the supply side, it's a small number of very large machines that last about 50 years. These are the big capital items. Uh, there's about a million of these machines. These are literally refineries, um, foundries, uh, and um, there's about a million natural gas and oil uh, wells. So that's the big machines over there. The demand side is actually an enormous number of small machines. These are probably machines that you, many of you manufacture that last about 25 years. This is a billion small machines. Climate policy historically lived over on the supply side, uh, but demand, now I'm actually pivoting to the, the a lot of the content is the speech I gave to the US Senate. Um, 
which was really trying to emphasize that we need to think about the demand side at the same time as the supply side and that politically the demand side is where Americans to live and live it's where the decisions that determine the quality of their lives happen and it's actually where the majority of our emissions uh, come from oh. so here's a um, just a quick emphasis on the urgency if you don't believe that we're going to do enormous quantities of carbon dioxide um, capturing and sequestration. I think we've overmodeled it in the IPCC. If you remove that and just say, we're probably not gonna do nearly as much as we think, these are the emission reduction trajectories you need to hit to hit 1.5 degree and two degree targets. Um, so one and a half degrees, which is where the scientists would like us to come in, requires as much as 80% reductions of 2020 emissions by 2030. That's, um, that's the challenge ahead. The reason I show you that chart, put them there is because I'm starting to think about the machines in terms of their lifetimes. I'd encourage you to do the same thing in industry, but this is to think about the household. Um, water heaters last 10 or 12 years. The load center, 25 years. Cars on average in the US last about 20 years. Dryers, 15 years. Stoves, 15 years. Furnaces, 20 years. And rooftop solar lasts about 20 years in the homes and sells 50 to 100 years. So if you think about that, um, if we were to electrify 100% of those machines at the moment they retire, so the next time you buy a car, it has to be electric. The next time you buy a furnace replacement, it has to be an electric heat pump, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That 100% replacement rate is that dotted line there. So we now need perfect execution for every purchase of every machine in the economy to hit our one and a half degree target. This is to emphasize that it is in fact an emergency and we need an enormous effort. If we're only getting replacement rates of 10%, you hit that top curve up there. Uh, remember 10% is the uh, market share of electric vehicles in California. It's about 2% in uh, the US as a whole. So we're tracking up here. That is we're way off target. 25%, 50%, not good enough. We've got to get to 100% uh, electrified machinery as soon as possible. 42% um, of our emissions actually emanate from the decisions made around the kitchen table. This is an emphasis on, on thinking about the demand side. This might help you think about some of the products you make. These emissions come from what fuels our cars, what heats our home, where does the electricity come from, how are the fuels made. Um, if you think that the decisions around small businesses in the commercial sector are also made around kitchen tables, which is largely true. That actually grows to about 65% of our emissions that are decisions, again, about not only our personal vehicles, but the fleet vehicles for our small businesses. Um, not only how we heat our homes, but how we heat our businesses uh, in the commercial sector. So this is ignoring industry, but that's to, to emphasize why we need to focus on those demand side machines. So these are cartoons as you would present to a senator about um, the difference between efficiency and electrification. So over here on the left, you fill your F-150 with fuel, close to 80% of it is wasted, about 20% of it is used to push the car forward. We've had 50 years of efficiency policy, which makes them slightly more efficient. Um, but if we go to electrification of that same F-150 with the F-150 Lightning, and if we power that with clean electricity from wind or solar, it actually uses less than one third of the energy of the original vehicle. Same is true in going from, you know, on the left here is a natural gas furnace. We've had huge, lots of money spent at the DOE going from 80% efficient uh, hot water heaters in the natural gas heaters in the 80s to about 95% now, but actually we have these magical things called heat pumps. Heat pumps, for, again, powered by clean electricity, use about a third of the energy of natural gas to, this is why the per BTU analysis for low temperature heat isn't really fair. You've got to actually compensate for the, the this extraordinary 3X efficiency win of heat pumps or multiplier, I should maybe call it. The same is true for going from natural gas furnace on the left to electric heat pumps on the right for uh, space heat. <clears throat> you get about two thirds of the primary energy consumption. Uh, so it's a big win. 
The same is true of um, cooking. In fact, if we go from natural gas, sorry, the, the actual graphs here aren't quite right. Actually, they are quite right. Natural gas cooking is about 30% efficient as is practiced in most residential commercial kitchens. They're getting slightly more efficient, but actually induction stoves are, are now shown to boil water with about 40% of the energy um, and cook with 30 or 40%. So another big win electrifying cooking, which is one to 2% of energy flow in the US. But then the biggest win from electrification, particularly if it's renewable, uh, that's a, my cartoon of a natural gas power plant on the left. They, the, the average fleet efficiency of electricity generation in the US is 38%. That means 62% is lost as waste heat. These clouds you see from the cooling towers is actually that waste, waste heat evaporating in water. We have, make, we have been trying to make these slightly more efficient, but obviously with solar or with wind, when you produce electricity, uh, you don't have any of this waste heat. And once again, you eliminate a huge amount of what are known as thermoelectric losses. If you take those cartoons and you go through all of those energy flows I showed you for the US economy, this is counterintuitive and not hugely popular amongst environmentalists I give this talk to, but you could literally use a substitution model for the US economy where you substitute heat pumps for low temperature heat, you substitute electric vehicles, for uh, gasoline powered vehicles. And you do those substitutions I just showed you and the whole American economy would only need about 42% of the primary energy it does today. That's how much more extraordinarily efficient electrification is than just merely slightly more efficient um, fossil fuel machinery. This is actually that breakdown. So you start with 101 quads, uh, turns out that about eight quads of energy we think we use in the US, we don't actually even generate in the first place. It's actually a definitional problem, an origin story problem of how we define uh, the primary energy of hydroelectricity and nuclear power. Um, about 16 quads would be eliminated, eliminating those thermoelectric losses. You can see how I sort of go sector by sector. Again, I'll let you go and look at this later, but all of those big wins from electrification is how you get to a 43 quad uh, America, same size cars, same size homes, same um, same amount of industry. Um, before I move on, a lot of you probably will say, you keep talking about electrification. What about our other options? What about hydrogen is the, one of the most popular ones? Uh, let's, this is a, a quick story about the comparing electrification of things to hydrogen. So on the top here, if we have an all electric pathway, one unit of electricity goes into a battery, you lose a little bit, then goes into a heat pump, which is typically has a CRP of three, you'll get about 324 units of heat for 100 units of electricity input with a very small amount of waste. If we take that same unit of electricity, you lose about 30% going into electrolysis, you lose another 15% compressing that so that you can store it, you lose a few percent in the transportation of a hydrogen fuel. You then lose about 30 or 40% again, going from the remaining hydrogen through a fuel cell back into electricity. Then you try and make it up with a heat pump and you, you're you know, about two and a half, half times worse off than the all electric pathway. Even on, um, if you go all electric to a resistance heater, it's about 83% efficient. If you go electricity to hydrogen to combustion, it's about 66%. So in, in nearly every case, all electric um, is your path. You can do the same analysis for transportation from electricity into a battery, into an electric motor, about 83% is converted into motion. If you go electricity to hydrogen, again, compression, transportation, and then combustion in the motor, it might be 34% efficient. 37% uh, if you go through a fuel cell. So you're twice, more than twice as well off going um, just the all electric pathway. And you can also do the same for high temperature heat, um, all electric, whether it's resistance or induction, about 8% efficient. Hydrogen to high temperature heat, maybe 61%. Hydrogen fuel cell to electricity to heat, really not very workable at all. Um, 
So that is to emphasize, we really only have one option. There's maybe enough biofuels in the US if we were extremely good at gathering them to do 10% of the total energy economy. The rest really needs to be electrified. So that's the, the key message there. Um, this is now how I've been looking at the world and trying to teach uh, people what we need to do. This is like literally thinking from the machine. So right down here, this is the vehicles and the appliances inside the house. They connect through the load center, batteries and some production on the house. Those are our distributed energy resources. These are actual um, measured loads of, of hundreds of thousands of these devices in the hours of the day. So the yellow spike is solar generation. The colored lines are when we actually want to use that energy. So this is a little bit of the story of how are we going to balance all of that uh, energy load. Maybe we can get to that in questions. Once you get to the house, there's 120 million of those connected to the transformers at street level. Um, the, those transformers are then sort of aggregated at suburb level to a distribution level substation. There's about a thousand homes under each one. There's about 185 million utility poles in the US serving that electricity to houses and industry. And then that aggregates up from substations to transmission level, which is then connected to our generation assets. And we need to think in detail about all of the machining and upgrades to do the electrification required. Quickly on households, there's 121 million of them in the US, 75 million are detached, 7 million are attached single family, like in our more crowded cities like Chicago, San Francisco. About 10 million people live in multifamily, 21 million people live in high, or households in high rise, and a surprising number, 7 million US households in mobile homes. This is to now give you a, a, a real scare about what the task is ahead of us. 58 million gas heaters still exist. They need to be replaced. 6 million fuel oil kerosene heaters still exist, surprisingly, despite their cost and inefficiency. 6 million propane heaters uh, or households still heated with propane. 56 million water, uh, households with uh, gas water heaters. 20 million gas dryers still out there. 35 million gas stoves, 6.5 million gas cooktops, 2 million gas ovens, there's still a couple of million gas fired hot tubs and one and a half million gas fuel pools and about 70 million propane powered barbecues. Uh, that's in addition to 220 million household vehicles running on gasoline or diesel. 25% of them are cars, half of them now SUVs and crossovers, 20% of pickup trucks, some minivans. There's even eight and a half million motorcycles. If you are, that's about 400 million machines that the US economy needs to replace with electric machines in the next 20 years. That's why it could be incredible for the companies. It's an incredible opportunity for the companies that go early. Um, those electrifying those machines requires new household infrastructure, including at least 50 million rooftop solar installations, at least 30 million household batteries, nearly every house needs to upgrade the load center. This The analogy in your industry is if, if I electrify my uh, heat and go off gas furnaces, you know, almost certainly it will trigger upgrades to the fundamental um, electricity supply. That's true in a household, it's true in industry. And then we're going to need 220 million vehicle charges. That in total is 400 and another 400 million enabling machines just to electrify them. Let's round it up. It's a billion machines uh, on the demand side that need to be to hit our climate targets of one and a half degree. That needs to be done at a rate of about a million machines a week or half a million households per month, every month for the next 20 years. Or another way of saying it is it's a machine per second that needs to be manufactured and installed somewhere in the US every second for 20 years. That will be millions of jobs that uh, most of them are in construction and installation, quite a few in manufacturing and uh, even more, in fact, in finance and sales. Uh, this is the what America has to win. Um, today on the right, that's the breakdown of household spending for the average US household. After taxes, the average US household, which has 2.6 people in it, spends $61,000 a year. $2,000 a year is on gasoline, which is more than they spend on fresh uh, meat and vegetables. $1,500 a year for that household is um, on electricity, which is more than they spend on education. 
and around $600 spent on heating fuels, which is more than they spend on dentistry. Uh, on the left, that's by decile of household income, the proportion of household income spent on energy. Um, for the bottom 50% of households, it's nearly 10% or more. So it's a very significant expense. This is the good news story. Um, this is the future that is playing out. I'm calling in from Australia. Um, some of you might have installed solar in, in your households in the US where it cost you $3 a watt and it's, it's about 20 cents per kilowatt hour electricity, which is not terribly cheap. Australia has optimized its regulations, uh, certification programs and its permitting and rooftop solar goes in at less than $1 a watt. That finances out at five or six cents per kilowatt hour of delivered electricity into the home. That is cheaper than natural gas by a factor of two or three per BTU, which makes it five to six times cheaper if you run it through a heat pump. So per BTU of delivered heat. Um, that will happen in the US eventually. Uh, it requires some regulatory optimization. Um, it gives you delivered heat at three cents a kilowatt hour uh, for low temperature heat, um, 10 cents a kilowatt hour for high temperature heat. Uh, we're only a couple of years away from batteries being installed at $100 a kilowatt hour. Um, that is predicted to happen about 2026. Uh, solar and wind is going onto the grid at three to four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, electric vehicles are projected to reach price parity with gasoline vehicles again in about 2025 or 2026. When those five things are true, if you run all of those numbers through the the upgrade we just did, after financing the capital cost changeover for the US household, um, they will be saving $2,500 a year in total cost of the services of energy. Um, so I think the, the idea that it's gonna cost us to solve climate change is untrue, but we do need to focus on the regulations that are artificially increasing the cost of these solutions. And we need to focus on getting manufacturing scale so that we can actually um, hit, hit these targets. So here's an awkward segue back to the industrial sector. Um, just a quick time check for me. I can't see a watch here. Uh, we have about 17 minutes left. Fantastic. All right. Um, hopefully this is going to be thought provoking. Um, this is the energy flow diagram for the US as addressed by the Build Back Better um, and Infrastructure Bill's collective efforts to, to address climate. So there was something called the Clean Electrification Standard, which was going to try and clean the supply into the electricity sector. That was that green bit that got killed before Build Back Better even started. Uh, there was the Clean Cars for America Act. This was the goal of 50% uh, electric vehicles by 2030. As I, if you think back a little bit, that's actually, we'd like to be at 100% electric vehicles sales by 2030, if we're gonna hit, a, hit anything under a two degree target. Um, but even so, the, that 50% is pretty ambitious uh, measured globally. That's that teal set of sectors at the bottom. The Zero Emissions Home Act, I was pretty heavily involved in, in trying to draft a lot of that legislation. That was focused on the residential sector, which touched a couple of the other sectors. That's all represented in yellow. There were very few, and in fact, basically no industrial or commercial sector um, components to that legislation. So the gray and orange sectors here were largely ignored. So not only are you feeling like there aren't solutions available to you as businesses, there weren't solutions really available yet um, that were shovel ready uh, and there were not enough industry groups representing in shaping that legislation to address industrial emissions. So you shouldn't feel alone. This was a problem all the way up to the regulation writing. Um, it's going to jump around a bit because I want to load a couple of big ideas in people's heads. Um, this is a map of uh, population density versus land area. So if you have a big square, that means you have a very big land area. So Australia is big, 
about nearly as large as the US. Russia, Russia has enormous land area, Brazil, China, Canada. Those six countries are the big ones. Sort of India and Argentina are, are, are in fairly distant seventh and eighth places. Population density is important for the reasons. You can see a, a black, two black lines coming across here. One of them, it says 1% land needed for renewables. And this other black one up here says 10% of land is needed for renewables. So this assumes that you're providing an all electric American lifestyle to all of the citizens. So in Australia to provide an all electric renewable lifestyle, to all of its citizens, it needs to use a quarter to one half percent of all of its land for solar and for wind. For the US, you actually need one to two, you know, two to three percent of all land area um, designated to wind farms and to solar in order to do uh, that American energy lifestyle electrically all renewably. At the level of China, you need to dedicate almost 10 percent of your land area. This is really an argument to say there will be nuclear in energy in the future. There has to be, there's only a very small number of countries. United States is probably on that boundary that could conceivably do their whole economy renewably. But once you get to these very high population density countries, Indonesia, India, China, they, they're not gonna get there um, without some level of nuclear power. Coming back to, um, and sorry, one of the reasons to, actually the reason I was bringing this up in terms of industry, it will be these large companies down and to the right that have lots of surface area um, and lower population density that will actually be able to produce excess renewable energy sufficient to produce um, material products of industry that will be exported to the world as um, green products. So to illustrate this in the Australian context, there's a big conversation about how will Australia, who's half of our export earnings today are at coal and natural gas, how do we replace those exports with energy exports in the future? Everyone then says, well, we should do hydrogen because it seems familiar, but actually, um, what Australia should be doing, and the United States should follow some of this, is, is producing excess renewables, or maybe even with some nuclear power. And instead of only upgrading 1% of our iron ore to steel, we should be using the cheapest renewable electricity in the world will occur in these big countries. We should be using that cheap renewable electricity to make green steel, make green aluminum, make green primary metals, um, for export to the rest of the world, because these other countries are going to struggle uh, to have enough en uh, renewable energy to drive their industry as well as their domestic economies. Returning to the industrial sector breakout. So 30 quads, it's, um, it uses a lot of energy. That might sound like more than the 25 that is typically measured. That's because I'm actually including the uh, thermoelectric losses from creating the nine quads of electricity that um, is used in the US industrial sector. So here's an interesting thing that happens. If we commit to an all electric future powered by renewables and by nuclear energy, at the top here, these are things that go away. Six quads out of 30 is those thermoelectric losses. They will disappear if we're powering it from um, wind, solar, hydroelectricity. Roughly 4% of the US energy economy today is using fossil fuels to um, refine fossil fuels. This is it mostly happens at refinery level where we use oil for the process heat for, for turning oil into gasoline and diesel and other, and other products. So if we have, uh, if electricity is replacing most uses for oil, that actually goes away. There's quite a lot of energy in the chemical industry um, that will disappear that's also used in processing fossil fuels. And you'll see actually down here under mining, 1.8 or close to 2% of US energy flow is oil and natural gas extraction. Um, quite a lot of this other extraction and materials handling is actually uh, processing coal and getting it um, and moving it. So this is to say, 
if we just commit to an all electric economy, most of that goes away and that alone halves the amount of energy we need for the industrial sector. There's another interesting component. So there's this, if you see where I'm circling here at the end of this green line, about four and a half quads or four and a half percent of US energy flow is fossil fuels that don't actually make it to be combusted as fossil fuels. They become embodied uh, materials in products. So this is all of our polymers. This is the asphalt that is a byproduct of the fossil industry that goes into roads. This is the asphalt shingles that make up 85% of the roofing materials in the US. Again, we, so this is a use of fossil fuels that conceivably is allowable because it's not leading to huge amounts of CO2 emissions. However, you really only get a lot of these things as byproducts of the fossil, fossil fuel industry, but probably that is a giant opportunity to find alternatives to those materials that don't have a fossil fuel supply chain. Um, once again, that will lead to a, another big reduction in energy consumption in the industrial sector. Finally, and this is probably intuitive to most of you, the big industries are pretty clear. Petroleum and coal products are um, a, an enormous consumer of energy in the industrial sector. Chemicals industry, which is dominated about two of those six are used for uh, creation of nitrogenous and, and uh, phos phosphoric fertilizers. Paper industry is a huge energy consumer. That's mostly in um, separating the lignin and the cellulose. A huge amount of that is actually the largest source of biofuels in the US because black, black liquor is the byproduct and is then used for process heat. So that's potentially we're not necessarily trying to lower that. We might just be trying to get higher value out of that black liquor. Uh, and then primary metals, so steel and aluminum dominates, uh, and then food production, which is a lot of low temperature process heat. Um, so big opportunities in thinking about these and uh, how we're gonna transform them electrically. This is something that many of you probably worry about. Um, obviously, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. This is the 20 year um, average seasonal history of solar production and wind production. So obviously solar production starts to ramp up in the spring, peaks in the summer, falls in the fall, uh, and is at lowest in the winter. Wind production counter correlates. So the wind production in the US is highest in winter, lowest in the summer. That is good. These average out nicely. This is why a lot of solar and a lot of wind is a good recipe, um, particularly if it's broadly geographically distributed. So this takes all solar production in the US and all wind production in the US. So it averages out across all of those wind farms and solar farms. This is why we need national level transmission infrastructure to iron out the flow differences. Um, this is the demand side version of that uh, chart. So the the black dots, this is the residential uh, energy consumption by sector if those if these sectors were electrified. So residential, very dominated by heat in the winter. In the shoulder seasons, in spring and fall, it is at its minimum. The summer, you get another peak, which is air conditioning loads. The commercial sector largely follows the same shape because it really is a built environment problem. It's heating spaces and cooling spaces. Uh, transportation, the solid line, um, actually the, it, it peaks a little bit in the summer. Um, the minimum is in the winter when it's a little harder to drive or people are sort of rugged up more. And then industry, you can see is this dotted line here. This is a bit of an argument to say, this, this is what we have to average out in the future. There may be huge opportunities for industry to actually shape its annual loads. So, you know, scheduling maintenance for the winter periods and other peak periods will start to make sense. If we take a future model of supply from that history, so I'm, I'm making a point now, remember those last two charts and then remember these second ones. I think it's important. Uh, it's very important actually. Um, if we said around half of our future energy supply will be solar, around half will be wind, we'll keep or double. This is in fact doubling the existing nuclear. So there's a hundred nuclear reactors in the US today producing uh, around about 20, 
20% of our electricity. If we doubled that, so it's about 200 gigawatts, that's that amount of nuclear, a little bit geothermal. Hydro doesn't really increase very much. And the bioenergy, which is largely that black liquor from uh, paper industry. If this was the balance, you can see the now the annual variations in supply. So if we superimpose that total cumulative variation in supply against the cumulative demand, this is the cumulative demand in gray, that's that supply. I think there's a very important point here. Overcapacity is going to be very cheap. Many of you worry about buying batteries and storage, but overcapacity is going to be the cheapest solution. What do I mean by that? Um, everyone has struggled to imagine what 100% renewables are, would, looks like. So they've, they haven't dared to think about what is 125 or 150% renewables like. This is to say, if we designed our wind and solar and hydroelectric and nuclear systems for the winter peak in loads, we actually will have a huge amount of overcapacity for the year. And the total overcapacity you need to build out is about 20 to 25%. If you think about solar and wind that's being installed at three or four cents a kilowatt hour, an overcapacity of 25% is only going to cost you one cent a kilowatt hour. That's enormously cheaper than using hydrogen for storing it for later or that for using batteries for storing it for later. This also, so inevitably there will be overcapacity in the shoulder seasons and maybe in the summer. Um, and I think this will actually start to make manufacturing schedules more seasonal again this will be the cheapest times of year for the cheapest energy so i think if you dare to contemplate in your businesses a future of not just like barely getting to 100 percent, but getting to an abundance agenda of 120 150 percent renewable it will be the cheapest pathway um, for industry to electrify Hey, so we only have a couple minutes, like two minutes here. All right. Okay. Well, I'm done. <laughs>